I am your host, Grayson Brulte, coming to you live from SAE's Government Industry Meeting in Washington, D.C. If you're just joining the series, I have to say it again, I love coming to the show because it brings together my policy and industry friends for important policy conversations. I'm absolutely honored to introduce our next guest from GI, Kevin Gay, Director, Head of Safety, Autonomous Mobility, Uber. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin. Hey, thanks so much, Grayson. I'm really happy to be here. It's great to have you here, plain and simple. Uber's gone back to its roots. You've become a platform, and Wall Street's rewarding that. You had the massive 55% growth last year. It's clearly, clearly working. As a platform, there's a lot of safety elements and concerns and, and questions that, that go into it. Kevin, overall, how is Uber approaching safety? So overall, Uber stand, one of our eight values is we stand for safety. And we see that in all aspects, whether, whether it's with riders, um, drivers, couriers. Like we care about safety very deeply. And that also carries into our autonomous vehicle uh, operations on the platform. In fact, in 2022, you know, we released our safety guidelines for autonomous uh, operators on our platform. And that was the first of its kind, really. And we thought it was very important to outline what our safety guidelines are for AV partners that are going to operate on our platform. And we feel like that is consistent with the way that we approach safety on all aspects of operations on our platform, both human-driven rides and, and deliveries and, and AV uh, as well. As I told you earlier, I'm 20-plus Uber rides already, so I'm, I'm, your, your, your team likes me because I use your service all, all the time. And I've noticed this really interesting feature. I was at CES last week in Las Vegas, and there was a road closure, and then the gentleman says, the, the driver said, I'm going to take you on a different route. And I get an alert in the, in the, are you okay? You're not on the route. Yes. That was fascinating. Yep. I felt I like, whoa, this is really good because I was going in a neighborhood that I wasn't like, where are we going? And then I was be able, I was texting with somebody at Uber, are you okay? And they kept checking in on me. Mm -hmm. How is that developed? That's a really smart feature. So that feature is called Ride Check. And so you can look at kind of how that works um, is that we look at deviation from the planned route or we look at long delays in a route as well. And so I've been in an Uber in San Francisco and we were stuck behind a truck and the truck was just not moving through the intersection and police were directing traffic. And I also got one of those alerts that said, hey, you've been in that, you've been in this position for a long time. You haven't moved from where you're at. Are you okay? Is everything okay? And you know, I ignored the text message and then I actually got a call. Yeah. And then, so I said, yeah, you know, we're all good. We're stuck behind this truck. It was during the economic conference last year and like everything's fine. But yeah, I think that's a good example of, you know, we care very much about safety and we're trying to innovate with new products for safety on both human driven rides and then understanding which of those carry over for AV rides as well. To me, this goes into Uber's culture of safety. Am, am I reading that right? I think it does. I mean, I mean since um, I, I rejoined Uber in February of 2022 after uh, being part of uh, Aurora for a while. And so coming back to Uber is seeing how important safety is. I work with our uh, global safety teams that uh, are responsible for safety across the entire uh, world. And it's it's really great to be in an organization that cares so much about it. And that, that certainly like magnifies uh, the work that I do because it's very clearly uh, a priority across our company that not only AV rides, uh, but human driven rides. Really, we have the safest platform is, is what we want. I mean, you publicly stated in a lot of your documents, Uber's a hybrid platform because you, you have both um, human drivers and you have autonomous vehicles. Are there safety teams on both sides? And if so, do you collaborate to do best practices together? That's right. There are. And there is certainly a large global safety organization that looks at all aspects of human driven operations, whether it's rides or deliveries on our platform. And then I lead the AV safety work on that is specific to our AV partners. But it's also another part of my job is really looking at seeing which of the aspects of the human driven uh, safety are going to apply to AVs. And there are certainly some differences there where uh, some of the safety aspects may not uh, translate over, but some of the ones that do, like sharing your location. That's a feature I use all the time in human-driven rides. We want to make sure that feature is still there in AV rides too, because people are comfortable with it. And so, yes, I work very closely with the other parts of Uber that are uh, focused on new safety products that we bring into the platform and understanding kind of how those will be customized and adapted for AVs as well. In 22, you developed the safety guidelines. 
what went into that? How did you? Was that from your your experience at Aurora, just from your, your deep industry knowledge, or, or how, what was the, the framework for that? Uh, well, when I when I first started, you know, one of the uh, my uh, my manager Noah Zitch was like, we need to develop our safety guidelines and come out with that and be able to share that publicly. And I, and I said, this is great. I, I love working on this. And so part of my process was to go through the industry safety standards that were out there, and there is quite a few AV industry standards out there that address different aspects of development and operations of AVs. And so it was a matter of sort of assessing all of those, which ones sort of fit into a framework that we can use and apply not just to sort of uh, public roads, but to sidewalk robots and apply it to kind of all aspects of AV mobility and delivery on our platform. And so I went through this process of trying to figure out like, what's the right structure for this? And I ended up settling on like three pillars, one being sort of an organizational pillar of like, how is the safety culture? What is, uh, what is like your safety processes from a management level? And then there's the um, engineering, I call it, or AV development side where you're really looking at how are you building the AV? And then finally operations, like the way that you operate the AV has safety implications as well. And so that's the way I've sort of thought of it is like, does the company have a good organizational safety culture? Are they engineering the vehicle in the way that makes sense? And then are you operating it in a way that ensures sort of safety of riders? And, and that became like the top level structure. And then from that, it was a matter of like figuring out out of what the 24 intermediate topics that we came up with um, and, and the standards that align with each of those. And it, it was really a great, a great project to go through. And then very, very gratifying to be able to publish that. And then so that way, when anyone uh, came to Uber and said, okay, well, what does it take from a safety perspective to operate on a platform? Like we can very clearly point to that. You're a bank. From, banks have the KYC policy, know your customer. So is this, is this Uber's version of, of know your customer? We want to know, hey, there's the, there's, you can't do anything bad here. We're, we're going we're to know exactly what you're building and how you're engineering it. I mean, it's more from the perspective of we want to make sure that we are ensuring safety and a due diligence process that, that is, ensures that we're comfortable with the products that we're putting on the platform and that we're comfortable with our customers taking rides in these AVs. And so we really view it as a partnership with our uh, with our AV uh, developer operator uh, partners and that we work with them on safety and we want to understand their approaches to safety because they do vary from one partner to the next and that we offer our perspective as well when uh, we're able to share kind of our thinking around different like safety approaches and around the things that we've seen either from our uh, AV standards work or from our own uh, past experiences in, in AV development. How do you message that to your riders? Because you know, if you message it in a certain way, you're going to build a really great level of trust. Yeah, that's the really interesting thing about doing about having a hybrid network is we're able to like introduce. Sometimes this could be a person's first ride in an AV, and maybe they're not sort of an early adopter who sought out AVs previously, but they're in Phoenix and they've said, "I just want to go from here to there," and it's in the app would. Uh, if, if conditions are right, would match them with an AV, and then they would actually surface it to them in the app and say, hey, you've been matched with an autonomous vehicle. Here's some of the specifics of that. Do you want to take this ride or not? And we give them the chance to opt out. But we offer them education, and we show them in the learn more section of the app, here's what it means to take a ride in an autonomous vehicle. What type of return rate do you get? So let's just say a customer went from – uh, Phoenix Sky Harbor to, to downtown Phoenix or from um, downtown Phoenix to Scottsdale. Do you see a very high return rate in the app? said, wait a second, Uber. No, no, no. I want to go on the, I want to go in the autonomous vehicle. I want to go in the autonomous vehicle. Are you seeing any sort of that data there? I mean, I think, I think we're happy overall with the rate at which customers are choosing to take autonomous vehicles. And I think that's really what we're looking for is to understand it, that our customers want to be in these vehicles and are happy uh, with the experiences that they have there. And so that's something that we're, we're definitely monitoring closely, that, that opt-in rate. And we think that so far we've seen very positive results from that and think it's great. If you look at the industry as a whole, you're the, the largest delivery ride platform in the world. I view you as the front line of, of public trust of developing it for the the entire industry because you have that frontline communication. Uber's on my phone, it's on millions of other individuals around the world's phone. Does Uber value that ability to, to build that trust for an, for an entire industry? 
Absolutely. And I think that's why we're very thoughtful in our approach. And that's also why, you know, we communicate with our customers and give them a choice. And so they, this, when they're, when they're presented with a ride, with an offer to ride in the Navy, they may choose not to do that now. And we want to make sure that we preserve that trust and that later on, when maybe they're more comfortable with riding and they, they choose that product. But I think ultimately what we really want is this to be a successful category of uh, operations on our platform. And we are very conscious of the role that we play in consumer adoption, I guess, in public acceptance of, of this. And in a lot of cases, it's also, you know, when people take a ride in an Uber and they request uh, a ride on an Uber, they don't think as much about which AV or which type of AV it is. They, they really associate it with Uber and that I took a ride in an Uber and it, it was the experience I wanted or, or it was not. And so we, we care very deeply about that and uh, ensure that we're, to the best that we can give our customers magical experiences, <laughs> we do so, AV or not. It's good for the brand. Uber's a verb. There's there's no other way to describe it. You're you're a verb. So that's the the passenger moving a person from point A to point B. How about on the delivery side? So you have the, the partnership with Swerve Robotics. You have the the Uber Eats business that just seemingly all it does is grow, and you're running uh, both Emotional and Santa Monica some Uber Eats deliveries there. How does it work from from a delivery standpoint? Yeah. So the way it works. So let's just take a sidewalk robot. You know, on the on the delivery side when. Uh, a, a delivery is matched with a sidewalk robot, you know, the, the robot goes to the merchant and then the merchant is able to bring the food out and place it in uh, the sidewalk robot and have the, the robot locks and drives in tran takes the vehicle, uh, takes the food on the sidewalk to the customer uh, that it's delivering to. And then the customer sees a notification that, you know, hey, your food's arrived, uh, please come outside to pick it up. And they come outside, pick it up open the uh, verify uh, pin and then open open the robot and take their delivery back inside. And so that's actually one of the key criteria for matching with, um, with a robot delivery is certainly they need to be able to come outside and pick up the delivery versus uh, having it left at your door. And so that's one of the characteristics we use certainly in matching the right trip um, and the right delivery to the right supply. From a safety perspective, op if it was the term, operating on a sidewalk is a different ODD than, than, than driving down, I'm going to give you a Walt Disney term, Main Street USA. It's a completely different op uh, operating domain. From a safety perspective, how do you develop for that? Because we've seen videos of, let's call them bad actors or, or not nice actors that do silly, stupid things. How do you plan for that from, from a safety perspective since you're operating on a sidewalk, you're not operating on a street? Yeah, so I think from a safety perspective, a lot of the same principles still apply from the top down. Still look at organizational safety, still look at the operational safety, and still look at how the robot's engineered. And so some of the things that you look at on sort of how does the robot perform around road u around um, sidewalk users? How does it perform around around children or pets or people with mobility assisted devices? Those types of scenarios still have to be tested by uh, the developer of the sidewalk robots. And we certainly ask about those cases as a part of our safety review process. Um, and then we also sort of understand uh, broad performance of the robot when operating on the sidewalk. Is it are there reports of you know? Um, contact with sidewalk users you know what is it what does the performance look like broadly and i think that's that's an area that we've had to adapt our framework to cover those because right now there isn't really anything that kind of addresses the sidewalk robot from from the safety perspective you know not as much standards work is being done but i think a lot of the same standards and the concepts there still have applicability on the sidewalk um but that's at a high level i think how we get there Let's look at it on sidewalk, but on a different ODD, um, very popular one, college campuses or large commercial office parks. Different, similar, but different ODD. Do you evaluate, let's call it each deployment, um, each instance differently because the those environments are characteristically a lot different. You're on a college campus, college kids do all sorts of interesting things. You're on a business park, if you misbehave, bye-bye. So you, there's different risk elements there. There are, and there are different environments that these robots operate in. I, I will say the serve robots operate in L.A., and that is a, a difficult environment in some aspects of operating with sidewalk obstructions and other uh, other things that they experience there and make it very unique. But to answer your question very specifically, yes, we do look at the environment very much so and you know certain aspects of the environment like are there intersections are you crossing intersections with the robot 
that certainly is a little bit different than like some of the college campuses that are maybe super contained and you're on really like internal sidewalks with no exposure to road vehicles. Uh, that's certainly a different uh, level of risk that you're incurring by just, you know, operating on those sidewalks, connecting the different buildings, you know, from uh, from main campus and all to the, the dorms versus actually having to go out on the streets of LA and cross uh, some of the sidewalk areas and the intersections they have to deal with. Are the partners sharing data with you so you can you can validate the safety case, you can get real hard data and you can really understand? Because to me, when you put somebody or a company on your platform, it's the Uber brand. It might be a product of emotional way most were, but at the end of the day, it's the Uber brand because that's who they had the interaction with. That's who they paid the money to. Yeah, and so uh, the thing I want to be clear about is we're not, our program is not focused on auditing or assessing every aspect of a partner safety case or safety approach. There's certainly companies that offer to do that out there, and that's not what we're trying to do. And a partner may choose to engage with those companies to audit or fully assess their internal safety case. What we're trying to do is ensure that the partners that are operating on our platform have provided us a reasonable approach to safety and that demonstrates that they've thought about all the things they need to think about to ensure that there's no unreasonable risk that Uber customers or the general public would be exposed to. And so it's a little bit different in how you approach that because you're not trying to, say, assess every single piece of evidence in a safety case, which is a monumental undertaking versus trying to understand is their approach aligned with industry standards have they uh, demonstrated you know a reasonable level of, of technical detail in specific areas it's it's sort of you know checking in on and probing in, in specific topic areas more than it is a, a broad-based assessment Does standards play a large role in your safety assessment yes and the in our safety guidelines we identified a number of standards that we for each topic area that we believe have value and should be considered by AV partners. They may have other ways to approach those topic areas, and that's certainly fine under our guidelines, but they need to sort of demonstrate that we've looked at this standard and made some judgment on it, and here's why we've you know, done things in the line with it, or maybe we've done things in a different way that sort of is, is beyond what the standard envisioned at that point. And I think that's very reasonable because if you look at automotive standards, they have always followed behind the technology as it's being developed. And so it's not unreasonable to me that, uh, you know, a partner may look at a specific standard and said, yes, we've, we've certainly internalized that. And we think we've got some reasons on why we go further than what's in that standard. Um, the other thing I would sort of add on to that is Uber plays a, a, a lead role in helping develop some of the AV industry standards out there. And that's really important to us as well because it helps inform our own process. Yeah, you, you do a wonderful job. You're, you're on the SAE ITC AVSC and you're doing really good work there. So thank you for, for that. Uh, expanding it outside of standards, you're very public. You have a very public relationship with Waymo. Waymo is operating, called, if you want to use the Waymo term, rider only in San Francisco, the Phoenix metro area, including Scottsdale. And then Waymo for the past, say, three months has been conducting a call, the Waymo One Tour in Los Angeles. And Team Waymo, well done on that because I like what they're doing. They're building trust. My background's in the music industry, and I feel that they're on a, they're, they're on a band on tour. And they're going there, and they're playing these different venues just happen to, to be cities and putting people in vehicles instead of people in arenas to hear, to hear a, a rock band. So well done, Team Waymo, on that. As they expand and eventually go rider only in Los Angeles, they have publicly stated without a timeline that they're going to do. From an Uber safety perspective, do you evaluate that ODD? Because having lived there, driving in Los Angeles is different than Phoenix. It's different than San Francisco. There's a lot of uh, edge cases or interesting scenarios, but the most common one is hurry up and wait. Because if you're trying to get over that 4 or 5 at 4 o'clock to go from Beverly Hills to Brentwood, it's going to take you an hour and a half and you're just going to sit. And the Uber asks, hey, you're not moving. Yes, there's something called traffic. We're in Los Angeles. Yeah, I, I can remember. I, I almost missed a flight in Los Angeles <laughs> once because I left a little bit too late to get to the airport, and it was it was quite a haul there. I was unaccustomed to that level of traffic uh, and congestion. And so, yes, the answer is as our partners expand to new operational design domains, especially new cities with new features and uh, things they have to account for, that is part of our process. So our process is is kind of three phased. And initially, we go through a planning phase with our partners where they identify, here's the concept of what we're going to do, whether it's mobility or delivery, here's the ODD. That fuels what's called a safety plan, where they share with us their safety plan for operating safely in that area. 
we use that safety plan as a part of our discussions. We have like technical in-person discussions, a demonstration of the capabilities of the system, all prior to or before launching on our platform. And so we handle expansions in a very similar way. Now, the difference is we have the benefit of prior operations on our platform uh, with a partner like Waymo in Phoenix, and that will certainly factor into the expansion into LA or any other markets if we uh, decide to, to work together in those areas. But it, it's additive in, in that way, in that it's not starting from scratch. If we have a partner who's deciding to expand to a new area with us, uh, and we're able to sort of leverage everything we've learned previously and work together to build that safety partnership and collaboration that we that our process helps um, stand up. It sounds what you've described as a relationship based in trust. I think it very much is, and that trust gets built in a number of ways. Like with our partners, it gets built through our interactions and the developments of the safety plan, our technical in-person meetings, our expansion discussions. It also gets built through collaboration on development of industry standards. And so, you know, Waymo and Motional and a number of other uh, companies are part of the AVSC. And so we work together with safety teams there. Waymo also uh, co-chairs and I chair the IEEE AV decision-making working group. All those things in my mind help build trust as well as sort of sharing some of your research and findings and activities publicly too. And so I, th I think it's all of those together that help do that. Collaboration is wonderful. We're, we see a lot of collaboration in AI from a lot of the academics and sharing the, the, the papers, new houses, they build their, their LLMs. Waymo, I think it was last week or the week before, put up a really fascinating video on X where they're testing very publicly now the highway driving in Phoenix. And it showed the Waymo vehicle going through, it was a crash scene, and there was a police officer on the right, the cones were out, a broken down vehicle on the left, and boy, oh boy, this vehicle just went through there very smoothly. So Waymo's going to highway speeds. Is that another evaluation through your partnership that you evaluate as part of that trust factor? Yes, I think the, so the operational design domain is composed of a number of different constraints effectively that govern what the system was designed to operate in. And so increasing speed or unlocking new areas of the map that have unique characteristics, those do factor into our process because again, through that same way as, as a geographic expansion, we seek to understand what is the experience gonna be like to our customers and what due diligence did our partners go through and what process did they go through to add those capabilities into their system. And so clearly there's validation and verification activities. There's you know virtual testing, track testing, road testing, all those different components. And so from our perspective, we want to understand kind of what process did they go through to unlock those capabilities, whether it's operating in work zones, as you described, operating at higher speeds um, or operating in, in totally new geographies. It's kind of the same thought process. Well, let's give a hypothetical here. I'm staying at a resort in Scottsdale. It's, it's, it's in the, the, the ODD, and I need to go to dinner at a restaurant. So I'll take my family to dinner at a restaurant, and I open up the Uber app. How does the Uber algorithm determine if I'm going to have a human-driven driver or I'm going to have a autonomous vehicle? Yeah, that's a good question. And so what we talked a little bit about earlier is that we have the ability to sort of match the right uh, supply with the right uh, trip. And so the trip characteristics actually really are a big determining factor in the ride use case because we look at our vehicles, our autonomous vehicles located close by, is one available? What is the um, wait time that a rider would have to wait for those vehicles? And then is the trip entirely within the operational design domain? And then so those factor in as well as eventually rider preference, if they set their preference and say that I would like, you know, additional AV trips, uh, they're able to sort of do that in the ride preference, in the uh, user preferences side of the Uber app. All those things sort of go in together and it's dynamic, right? Like it depends on how many other trips are out there at this point in time, because uh, that's sort of the supply and demand side of things. And we are able to sort of take all that into account and then come up with a solution that points to, okay, this trip is gonna be served by an AV, this trip's gonna be served by a human rider. And then um, with AV trips, riders certainly have the ability to, to say, no, I'd rather be served by a human-driven trip if they have other um, 
needs that are not communicated sort of in the Uber app. If they need help with the mobility device, if they need, uh, you know, help with uh, the vehicle, getting in the vehicle or, or something like that, they may choose to have a human driven. So all those things go in together. And I think that's what makes it unique and kind of our hybrid approach. Can riders opt just to take AVs only if they're in the ODD? Is there a feature in the app that they can just say, um, hey, Kevin, or I'm sorry, Uber, I, I would just appreciate a time stick only if it's not available as a, as a fallback? Can they opt into that? That is not the way that we've built the technology now. And part of the reason is because we want to be able to have that right match, the right trip uh, with the right vehicle type. And so we ask riders, we give them the option to sort of uh, indicate that they have a preference for AVs, but it is not sort of a forced match, I guess, if you'll call it that way. Instead, you know, we take into account all those characteristics and in, including, you know, where the vehicles are at, are they online, are they nearby, and what are the characteristics the trip uh, has of, for that rider. And, and so that's the way we're approaching it. So you're operating a hybrid network. Why was that decision made to operate this hybrid network? Because you can make one argument that oh, Uber should only be drivers and that they don't need to go back into autonomy, but I think it's real, it, it, it's asset light now and it's, it's, it's really, really smart. Why was that decision made to operate a hybrid network? Yeah, I think the probably the best answer to that is really that we expect there to be human-driven and AV rides operating in parallel for a number of years. And so we see the hybrid network as really, you know, the best way to introduce AV technology that right now operates in limited design domains, geographic areas. And so AVs really aren't capable of serving sort of all trips. They can service a subset of trips and they can increase supply on the platform. So it seems natural to use them to augment human-driven trips. But you know, in the near future, we don't see a world where AVs are going to be able to service you know, 100% of trips in you know, a given area. You see the world real. You're being honest. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. You're right. So let's fast forward to the future. There's multiple Uber or Thomas Vehicle Partners operating in multiple states, operating in multiple domains, multiple companies. And let's fast forward some point in the future where we have bespoke vehicles where they, they partner with an OEM. They, they built their own vehicle from the ground up. How does that change the safety case? Because if you're Waymo's operating on the Jaguar I-Paces today, it's not hard to get your hands on an iPace manual from, from JLR to find out all the, the, okay, what's the redundancy and all these other things. But if you're building a bespoke vehicle from the ground up, either with a global OEM or on your own, it seems that there's a lot of questions or research or learning that has to go understand. So how do you evaluate those vehicles eventually going on the platform? Yeah, it's a really good question. And so in my mind, I do think of those as slightly different from our, our safety evaluation and our safety assessment process actually accounts for that in one of the categories that we look at is the base is what we call the base vehicle platform and so in the base vehicle platform in the u.s for instance it looks at is the vehicle uh what's called you know fmvss compliant and so that's the federal motor vehicle safety standards that are established by the u.s department of transportation and so the jaguar is a you know fmvss compliant vehicle that you can buy in the u.s now versus a purpose-built vehicle um, has to go through potentially, you know, a separate process to be able to say, yeah, it doesn't have a steering wheel. It doesn't have brake pedals. And here's why that's okay. And here's why that uh, is, is um, you know, allowed under, under the regulatory regime here. And so that's sort of the difference that we look at it from. And it, it kind of comes down to there is a federal agency that looks at uh, these purpose-built vehicles and there's an exemption process they have and other processes they have. Uh, and part of our safety assessment framework is to say, you know, has our partner secured all the necessary approvals that, that they need to operate that vehicle type? And so I think it just, it looks a little bit different for purpose-built vehicles. But then all the other aspects that we talk about of the automated driving system, you know, those carry over in many ways from whether it's a purpose-built vehicle or whether it's a, a conventional vehicle. Uh, in the, the way that you approach validation and verification, your safety culture, the way that you're operating the vehicle, most of those actually carry over and aren't really affected by what vehicle the kit gets integrated into. Uh, and so that's where we, again, focus a lot of our attention is really into how that ADS, that automated driving system, is developed. As you develop the guidelines in, in, in your framework, what role does redundancy play in that? Because if you're going to not have a human in there, 
you have to have redundancy. You're going to know it's a lot better than I am, but it seems that you have to have multiple sources of redundancy. What role does that play as you develop the framework and guidelines? It, it's actually, that is getting, what that's actually sort of getting at is how is the system going to behave in the event that there's a fault or a failure? And say there's an Uber rider in the car and there's a situation that the AV is unable to deal with or there's an internal system failure that it has to deal with. The way we think about it is how is, what is the Uber rider going to be ex basically experiencing? Is the vehicle going to stop in lane? Is the vehicle going to move out of the lane of travel? When the vehicle stopped in lane, how do we ensure the safety of the rider when they're in the vehicle? Or if the vehicle has to move over and move out of the way, or if the vehicle is able to get to a parking lot or other areas. And so we're not necessarily looking at like, do you have redundant steering, redundant braking, and sort of assessing at that very technical level that I think the, our AV partners are absolutely doing. What we're looking at it is a little more holistically in what's going to happen in the event that there is a fault or a failure or an ODD changes dramatically and it goes from perfectly sunny to, uh, you know, pouring rain and you're, there's basically the system's not able to operate in that ODD change. How does it respond to that? And because we're, we're more concerned about it from sort of the system level and from the user perspective. And, and that's what our process really focuses on. That's really smart because Arizona can get a flash flood. It's very, I'm, I used the term monsoon. I mean, it comes down, it's not fun, and it comes down really hard for 10, 10 minutes. So let's use that scenario. The uh, I'm not going to name the names here, but the autonomous vehicle pulls over the side of the road very correctly and very safely. The monsoon rain passes. Does an, is an Uber human driven vehicle to come to get it? Does, or, or do they just, that passenger wait then to once the monsoon to enter? What does that interaction look like? So we always want our, our riders to have. Uh, support and to have support tools they need and to have the choices that they need as well. And so in the event there is um, a, there is an incident where uh, the AV has to um, stop uh, driving at that point, like we give the rider options. There's certainly in-vehicle support you know, and the in-vehicle support is able to talk with the rider and understand what the situation is and provide reassurance and, uh, and a human touch in that. Then riders also have the ability, if they want to cancel the trip and have a, a remat and ha request a, um, a human-driven trip, we can do that as well. Because again, we have you know a, a, the scale of our platform. Uh, if uh, a Navy is unable to continue to its destination and, and stops, then we can the rider can request you know to have a human-driven vehicle take it to its destination, or the rider could continue the. Uh, continue the trip on foot if they're close to the endpoint that they want to. And so there's a variety of scenarios that we've thought through, uh, but we do use sort of human driven trips in the event that we need to get a rider to their destination if the AV is unable to, to make it there. It's become really clear to me. So you, you have the culture of safety, but it seems to me you have the culture of the rider where you, res where you respect the rider at all costs. So you're, you're putting the safety to protect the, the rider to ensure a smooth experience. Is that the core of Uber is, is a really great rider user experience? I think it's both the rider side and it's sort of, we look at it holistically. We want our earners, our drivers, our couriers, our riders to really have that sort of safe, magical experience on our platform. And so it, certainly in the perspective of AV rides, we are looking at it very much from the rider perspective and how can we ensure that this is a product they're gonna wanna use in the future and that's gonna give them confidence in this uh, in this new technology. So we talked earlier a little bit about the, the Uber Eats business and it, it's growing and you have the delivery with Motion and Santa Monica and you have Swerve. As AVs become more online, you have the partnership with Neuro as well. Do we start to see more autonomous delivery options being added to Uber Eats? Yeah, I think we're continually evaluating additional partnership opportunities and seeing what they are able to bring to the platform and what they're able to bring to our customers. And I think it goes back to, you know, in certain cases, in certain areas, a sidewalk robot is going to be well suited to a delivery. And in other cases, it's going to be a conventional or it's going to be an AV operating on roads. If it's a long duration delivery, you're probably not going to send a sidewalk robot to do that. You're going to have either a conventional human driven vehicle or you're going to have an AV that can operate on public roads at higher speeds to get that order to its destination. And so I think for delivery, we're continuing to evaluate similarly to rides in that as the technology matures and is able to serve different use cases on our platform, we will absolutely consider it. 
You have a very good track record on the human driven side of your business around rider safety and the, and the amount of good things that, that the safety team does to ensure the safety of those riders. And when I think about autonomous vehicles, autonomous delivery, there's not a human there when they go to pick their burrito up or they pick up their delivery. From a safety perspective, do you look at having cameras there or suggesting to your partners protect the safety to make sure that there's nobody ar- around that individual when, when they're picking up their food? Because if you have the human there and there's an incident, they can you know help and protect that individual. Do you kind of go to, to that level? We haven't really approached it in that way. Like certainly like the the video around the sidewalk robots offers some additional sort of in, information for you know our av partners um ultimately though the deliveries are, are going to in a lot of cases a person's home or a person's you know residence or to you know apartment building and things like that and so ultimately you know we want our customers to feel safe with any delivery that they receive uh, through uber you know, we offer support and that they can reach out through support contacts uh, through the app. And so that's really the venue that we've continued to operate in and to uh, ensure safety is that looking at it through uh, our support teams and what we're able to offer uh, to our customers whenever they pick up a delivery. You're doing the right things and we're, you're just merely in the first thing when I think baseball game, at least where I think you're going and where you publicly say to the markets where you're going with autonomy in the hybrid platform. Overall, what is Uber's approach to autonomy and autonomous vehicles? You have a platform. You could do a lot of special things there with autonomy. What's your overall approach? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, our approach is really to build out this hybrid network so that we can make Uber the best place to the best platform to deploy autonomous vehicles around the world. And so the things that we're doing now are laying the foundation to build out and continue expanding autonomous operations on our platform, building these features for our customers, uh, building the support functions, you know, working with these uh, AV fleet partners and operators, and continuing to sort of build out our own capabilities as a platform that are going to enhance AV operations. Because again, we're going to see AV operations alongside human operations for quite a while, and so we want to we want to basically grow both of those to grow overall supply. Um, on our platform. In your opinion, how should our listeners think about Uber as it relates to autonomous vehicles and safety? What message do you want them to take away with them? Yeah, so I think, you know, the key thing that we've tried to describe and really convey is that, you know, we care very deeply about safety. We certainly, you know, are not the the builder or developer of these AVs that we're operating and uh, that are operating on our platform. But we really feel that our safety approach that we've implemented is absolutely critical to it being a successful product long term and having that public acceptance that we want of those of this technology. And so in a lot of cases, you know, folks have sort of asked, well, why does Uber have this safety approach for AVs when you're, you're not the one sort of developing the tech? And, you know, the answer is really simple. It's that we want our customer. We want this to be the safest platform for our customers. And we have a duty from our side to understand how a, an emerging technology like AVs are and, and safety is being developed and built into those products. And we can certainly see how that's going to lead to a, a more successful adoption uh, of this of this technology and more interest from our, um, from our customers in using it. I would summarize it this way. Safety builds trust. Trust equals more rides. And that's, that's what you want at the end of the day. So when Dara's there on, a, on an earnings call, yes, we increased our rights. That's what, the, that's what your shareholders want to hear. And, it's, and I, want to, I want to have a really great experience because I'm going to keep using your products. And so maybe I'll, the first 20 days of next month, I'll have 100 rides on the Uber. Then, you, then they'll really like me so. and I'll become a power user. <laughs> Kevin, this has been great. And I really thank you for shedding this really great insight into Uber in this approach to Thomas vehicle safety. As we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? Yeah, no, this has just been great. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about how Uber thinks about AV safety. And I encourage you know our listeners, if you're in the Phoenix area and you're able to hail uh, an AV ride through the Uber platform, I absolutely would, uh, would absolutely encourage that and hope people get out there and are able to uh, experience AVs for themselves through the Uber platform. Go to Phoenix, fly to Phoenix, good for the tourism economy. Open your Uber app, hail a Waymo, experience the future. Today is tomorrow, tomorrow is today, the future is Uber. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on SAE Tomorrow Today. Thank you so much, Grayson. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening to SAE Tomorrow Today. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, 
please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.